Hello and welcome to the first video lecture of the class. Uh, we're going to cover chapter 15, The Rise of Empires in the Americas. This is more or less what I would have done in person if we were meeting, but uh, we're not right now and won't until after February 1st at the earliest. So a couple of different groups of people I want to talk about today. There's the Toltecs, there's the Mayans, the Wari, the Aztecs, and the Inca. And I'm going to kind of go from oldest to newest. And this is just to give you an overview real quick of what's going on in the Americas when European explorers come here. Uh, the Toltecs, they've been around for a while. Um, the earliest Toltecs, or Toltecs uh, exist around 200. And I will fully admit I did not take Spanish in college. I took German, so some of these pronunciations will be wrong, and I apologize. But the Toltecs originated from the city-state of Teotihuacan, which was kind of in northern central Mexico. And the city ended up falling apart because of internal rebellion and internal uprising. And some of the people of the city moved south to this to a new city called Tula. Now, after this uprising in Teotihuacan, uh, the population of the city went from around 200,000 down to 30,000. So a good number of people moved out. Uh, the city of Tula was about 60 miles or so south, and it's a new city. And people moved from all around to the city of Tula. And before you know it, <clears throat> Tula has over 100,000 people. And the Toltecs really rebuild their civilization. Now, this taking over the city, this building of the city was not 100% peaceful. There was already a settlement there. And the reason we don't think it was peaceful is because there's a myth called the, the myth of um, Topiltzin, which basically said that the the god Quetzalcoatl would return when the time was right to avenge the Toltecs, if you will. Now, the reason that's important is because this myth of Tolpitzin is what Hernan Cortez uses when he meets the Aztecs hundreds of years later. Now, the Toltec are, are known for a couple of things, and that is primarily with warfare innovations. Uh, they developed a short sword that was made of obsidian, and I've got a picture right here of what that sword would look like. Um, <clears throat> obsidian is a very, very sharp and hard glass, and so that would pretty much fillet you if it hit you. And then similarly, they developed a dagger, a little short knife made of obsidian that would just slice you open. One other thing about the Toltecs <clears throat> is they traded very much with their neighbors. There's Toltec obsidian found all throughout Mexico. And then we have evidence of, of cocoa or cacao and vanilla being brought into the Toltec areas from further south where the Mayans live. And speaking of the Mayans, uh, Mayan kingdoms are found throughout the Yucatan. Uh, the period I'm talking about specifically is kind of the final period of, of the Mayans, but they were in existence prior to where this class picks up. In the year 650 to 900, it's really seen as this renaissance, if you will, for the Mayans. There's a lot of agricultural expansion. There's lots of monument building. There's lots of... Um, pyramid building, but this is going to end up actually being their downfall because there's so much agricultural expansion that when these torrential downpours happen, all the topsoil is washed away and the ground is depleted of all the nutrients needed to support the population. Now, some of the kingdoms that surrounded the Yucatan, uh, they are able to survive a little longer. <clears throat> primarily because they didn't need as much agriculture and their climate was more dry. 
But eventually, some of the surrounding kingdoms, such as uh, Chichen Itza, uh, they're going to fall as well. Now, the Mayans were known for their trade. They traded with Toltecs. They traded with other Mayans. And there's even evidence of Mayan trade as far north as the America, like the United States, America, uh, the Mississippi River Valley, the um, states of Mississippi, and even as far north as Missouri or Illinois have some examples of Mayan trade happening. Now, the Mayans, they used many of the same weapons as the Toltecs. Uh, there was a lot of crossover between the Toltecs and the Mayans. Uh, it wasn't complete crossover, but they did know of each other and support each other. Now, if you're curious, this top piece of artwork right here, it is depicting chocolate. Uh, chocolate was actually used as a currency in the Mayan Empire. This is a group of people that's not known very well. It's the Tiwanaku and the Wari. Uh, they were actually two different cities located in South America in what is today Bolivia. Um, they were both political and cultural centers, and they competed with each other. Um, the city of Tiwanaku was located on Lake Titicaca, and the city of Wari was in the mountains north of Lake Titicaca. Uh, they both established colonies. Uh, they both traded with their neighbors. They both had you know, political control of the area surrounding them. Now, the Andes is the mountain range along the western edge of South America. And normally you don't think of mountains as being a very hospitable place, but in the case of the Andes, it really was. Um, there, There's fresh water, there are streams, there are rivers, there are lakes, uh, there's fishing, there's perfect land for agriculture. Uh, oftentimes the farmers of this area would use raised fields or they would farm on the sides of mountains to try and maximize the amount of land used for um, for food growing. One unique thing about these populations is they used the idea of reciprocity. Uh, what reciprocity was, it was the people of these communities working together doing community labor so that way they could have community feasts. Basically, th these are entire populations that work hard and then play hard together. Now, both of these cities were governed by an elite upper class and over time, um, as the feasts grew smaller and the harvest grew smaller, the elites lost control. And before you know it, the residents of the cities turn on the elites and burn down their, um, basically their way of life out of uh, civil unrest. The Aztecs are pretty famous. You've probably heard about them, uh, but you may not know a lot about them. Uh, they dominated central Mexico only for about 120, maybe 150 years. Uh, their ancestors were thought to have been Toltecs and these ancestors moved further north until they locate and this is a true story i'm not making this up they there was a legend <clears throat> that one of their gods told them to settle if they found an eagle sitting on a cactus and aztecs move further north and they come across an eagle sitting on a cactus next to a lake bed so the Aztecs say, we're meant to be here. So what happens is as a thank you to their God who led them there, they start doing ritualistic sacrifice. They would think that their, their God needed to be pleased through the spilling of blood. So what they would do is they would take either an innocent girl or a young woman, or they would take a, um, a prisoner of war, they would take the ritualistic victim to the top of a temple, they would slice the heart out while it's still beating, they would spill blood all over the steps of the temple, and then they would take a bite out of the, the body 
including sometimes the still beating heart. If you've ever seen Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, uh, the scene where the where the person reaches into the chest of the woman and tries to pull out the heart, that is supposed to be based on Aztec myth. The Aztecs compl uh, they conquered a lot of land. Um, the army of the Aztecs was large, there were over 25,000 soldiers, and they used this to conquer dozens of surrounding people. Now, some of these people continued to resist the Aztecs, others gave in unwillingly. Uh, basically, when the Aztecs took you over, you were supposed to submit to them. If you disagreed, the Aztecs would attack and force you to agree. Those city-states who disagreed and remained in opposition, well, that's who the Spanish used to conquer the Aztecs when the Spanish came to Mexico. One other thing about the Aztecs is there's this unique agriculture called a chinampa or chinampa. And it's what this picture is here at the bottom right. Uh, basically, they're floating rafts that are tethered to the bottom of the lake. And on top of these rafts, they would put dirt and leaves and they would grow all their food on these rafts in the lake. And then they would have like a little anchor down to the bottom to keep their raft from floating away. And these chinampas are still used in central Mexico today. All right, last but not least, we have the Inca. The Inca are centered around the city of Cusco, which was actually a neighbor to Tiwanaku. Uh, Tiwanaku is on the northern part of the lake. Cusco is on the southern part of the lake. Uh, as Tiwanaku and Wari weakened in power, uh, the city of Cusco grew stronger and stronger and stronger until finally in 1438, uh, Pachacuti Yipanqui uh, becomes known as the first emperor of the Inca. Now, um, his title was called Sapa Inca or Lead Inca. And he kind of takes power through a rebellion. His brother uh, was supposed to be the one in charge. His dad, Vera Cocha, uh, left his brother uh, to be the next emperor. Pachacuti didn't like it, beats his brother up, and takes over power. Now, once he becomes the Sapa Inca, or the emperor, uh, he's going to start this huge campaign of expansion and before you know it the Inca Empire goes all the way from northern Ecuador into the middle of Chile. It's like 2,500 miles of empire from north to south. Now how did he keep this empire together? Well he had four different governors and these governors kept the different provinces in check. All total there were about 80 different provinces so you got four regions, you've got governors, you've got provinces, and everybody who was in power had to be an ethnic Inca. Uh, the Inca would even move in ethnic Incan families into villages they took over to try to encourage basically ethnic mixing. Two other interesting things about the Inca, uh, there's the idea of the Mita. Uh, Mita uh, basically, you had to perform works for the emperor instead of paying taxes. So when it came tax time, instead of giving over money, the Inca would order you to build a road or build a monument or build a, a temple or maybe even um, serve in the military. Now, all of this was kept in records on something called a kipu. And the kipu were knotted ropes, and these knotted ropes, which I absolutely cannot read, uh, they would keep track of population, they would tell you how many people there were, and they would let you know if the people of that town or village had performed their mita duties or not. 
Now, last but not least, there's over 25,000 miles of roads built in the Inca Empire. Uh, the Inca Empire, um, the, the, like I said, 2,500 miles of distance from point A to point B. Uh, these roads were used to transport messages and transport people. And you can only use the roads if the emperor okayed it. If the emperor did not give permission, you were caught on the roads, you could be killed. Another interesting thing about these roads, they had a, somebody stationed about every 15 miles. And person A would run to the next station, hand off the message, and then person B would run full speed to the next person. And that's how they transported information. They would have somebody every 15 miles so you could run full speed, hand off the message, and then that second person could run full speed. Now, there are a lot more things to, about Central and South America, but I just kind of want to ease you in. Next lecture will be a little bit longer. Um, I hope you have taken a little bit of time to look at the course and to look at the introduction video. Um, it is right now 3 o'clock on Tuesday the 12th. If you email me in Blackboard between now and Thursday the 14th, at 3 p.m. and say, hey, Mr. Kennedy, I watched your video. I'll go ahead and give you 10 extra points on your quiz for this week, uh, just as a bonus and a thank you for being an early person to watch the video. That's it for now. If you have any questions, email me and good luck. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.